This week, I psychoanalyze Elon Musk. Usually I have to be drunk to be effective at such things, but I'll give it a shot sober this week with a cup of coffee and a thimble of Brian's tears. What's that now? I got them from a witch. It's not that hard. Hmm. Okay. Wind power generation in the U.S. declined for the first time since the 1990s, and the reason may shock you. Was it because it's less windy? Yes. Okay, then. Rethink Access turned its analysis to humanoid robots disrupting labor. They'll add gasoline to the fire of the energy transition, the report states. The robots will also ensure I never have to do the show sober again as one will mix my drinks prior to each show, Brian. Eco-friendly clothing company Patagonia has figured out how to completely recycle wetsuits over and over again. This is great news. I can finally take up surfing, because the inability to recycle wetsuits was the only thing stopping me. All that and more on this edition of the Clean Energy Show. And also, this week... There's an international report on the carbon capture coal plant in Saskatchewan, where Brian and I live, in Canada, and it ain't good. More battery breakthroughs. More. Uh, a smart grid for a small city on Prince Edward Island in Canada. And batteries, Brian, are proven already to be 95% recyclable. Lithium-ion batteries, the kind you find in cars and grid storage. But can they be even 100% or beyond 100%? The answer is yes. I'll explain why, and I know you want to listen to that because it doesn't make well, any sense. I know you love to give 110%. Absolutely. So I think it makes perfect sense. Uh, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, otherwise known as the IEEFA, has a report on the state of carbon capture at our very own CCS, Carbon Capture and Storage and Sequestration on uh, Boundary Dam 3, which is in our province here in Canada, our small province. And it is uh, one of the first to do so, but they've got a report on it and they were not doing well. Uh, we, we debated last week how many billions it was. It was one. This one says a billion dollars Canadian to add carbon capture technology. The project is still capturing uh, far less than the 90% it was originally promised. It was supposed to catch capture 90% of the CO2 emissions. Uh, but we'll have more of that in the lightning round. Uh, CATL, the, you know, sodium ion battery update, Brian, last summer on July, we had this wonderful news of uh, CATL um, first generation sodium ion battery with an energy density of uh, 160 watts for every kilogram. That's kind of how much power can you get into one sort of chunk of size. And it's important because cars, you can't be too heavy and everything like that. The sodium ion batteries could be charged for up to 80% in 15 minutes at room temperature, which is pretty good. Um, generally on the highway, you only charge to 80%. So 15 minute stop is better than the 18 minutes you can potentially get in some of the Hyundai uh, with 800 volt uh, architecture. And it had a decharge retention rate of more than 90% at temperatures as low as minus 20, which, I heard a YouTuber, uh, the Electric Viking, this morning say, nobody gets down to minus 20, virtually nowhere in the world. <laughs> we, <laughs> we should be opened up an EV, uh, you know, study center, a laboratory here for cold weather, because we each have two electric cars each, and it gets down to minus 40. It can. And it certainly spends and, a lot of time below minus 20. Sometimes and very, very windy sometimes at the same time. And that's what happened this year. And some, for some reason, it was worse with the wind on a car, even though they don't have skin. Anyway, now they say they have a second generation of that battery already. It has not even been a year, Brian. And it's it's up to 200 watt hours to kilogram per kilogram. That's 25% more energy density. So it's 25% better. And it's not even been a year. They haven't said that they're releasing it just yet, but they're there and they'll announce it shortly. Uh, this is the world's largest battery maker coming up with innovations that they just kind of casually mention. It's just, yeah, because if, you know, my, my concern is that nobody's going to make a cold weather battery for us because we're there's only a few million people here in the prairies of Canada that suffer this cold weather. That's But maybe someday they will. Maybe if you order a Tesla, you can have the option of the cold weather battery chemistry and uh, it'll just work better in the winter as far as when you're charging it and it won't lose so much range. So that's that's encouraging because we talked about battery uh, improvements last week and there was a whole 
hoard of them, and now there's even more. It just keeps coming. It's v very important to the energy transition because it stores solar and wind when they're not producing, and um, you know it's it's going to be a big deal for the speed of transition. And of course, cars will get better, and we'll stop burning oil hopefully. Yeah, and lithium ion is the default, and that's still a pretty good battery. Sodium ion, slightly different, but there's many different kinds of chemistry combinations that are being tried that can, you know, be looked at in the future. It's still very, very early days, really. And they had a hybrid battery where a few of the cells had a little bit of lithium in them. And for some reason, this was advantageous, maybe for, I don't know, I don't know why. Perhaps speed, you know, discharge rate was faster, I'm not sure. So... You're using a lot less lithium. Everyone says we can't do the, work, the the energy transition because there's not enough lithium in the world. My son's uh, engineering professor said that, and no, I I should be teaching. <laughs> well, no, I shouldn't be teaching, but <laughs> yeah, it, just, it frustrates refining... me. It frustrates me, frustrates me when smart people don't quite get it. They don't quite understand what's going on. Yeah, there might be a limit with refining capacity for lithium. It's something like that, but, you know, absolutely You know who's soluble. not complaining about the amount of lithium? The actual battery makers who are making all these batteries. They're not saying one word about supply constraints or anything like that. Um, if anything, it's manufacturing constraints. So the, Rethink X, that is uh, the uh, think tank that talks about disruption. So we, we our show is largely about disruption. The disruption, how uh, clean energy is cheaper and better than other energies, that electric cars uh, ultimately will be cheaper and better than other technologies because uh, the technologies that are in those things have become cheap enough and good enough and they've all converged. Well, they're now talking about humanoid robots. Tesla is making a humanoid robot and other people are too. In fact, uh, you might think this is science fiction, but there are humanoid robots working in Chinese auto auto plants right now. I don't know what they're doing. They're probably not doing much, but that's not the point. The point is they exist and they're going to get better every day and do more every day. And uh, yeah, so they've got this big report out. I'm going to link it in the show notes. Uh, I suggest you have a look at it. It's like AI. It's one of those things that's coming and there's AI involved in these things, but it's it's very compelling read about how the economics, you know, it's good. They're going to start at ten dollars an hour. The it'll be the equivalent of ten dollars an hour, but then after ten years or after twenty thirty five, it's going to be, um, you know, one dollar an hour, and then twenty later on, it's going to be you know ten cents an hour. And and don't think about it just in terms of taking jobs. Think about it in terms, initially at least, of doing tasks. So. Uh, it does affect what we talk about on the show because it accelerates. They say it's going to accelerate the speed of things that we talk about here. Um, if you can have a robot making a solar panel, it'll do a better job. It'll, um, you know, it, it, it won't cut corners. Um, that's kind of the theme here. And there's some things that I haven't thought about. I'll touch on them. Uh, they say we are on the cusp of a new disruption, physical labor performed by humanoid form robots. The critical disruptive components of the new labor engine include sensors. So these are the things that are converging. The sensors are getting better and cheaper. That's cameras, tilt sensors, pressure sensors, microphones, accelerometers, etc., to take in sensory data. That's all kind of at a point now where it makes sense to do these things. Computer hardware has advanced and software to process sensory data with powerful AI. Actuators to move and interact with objects in the environment and batteries, of course, are more powerful. We just mentioned that. And, you know, they're smaller and more dense to run these humanoid-like things, Brian. Yeah, and of course, you can't have a true transformative disruption without many technologies converging. But of course, this is exactly what's happening. Um, if we had the computing power, but none of the actuators, you know, none of this would work. So it goes on to say each of these technologies has gotten dramatically cheaper and more powerful in recent years. Over the next 15 to 20 years, humanoid robots will disrupt human labor throughout hundreds of industries across every major sector of the global economy. The disruption of labor will be among the most profound transformations in human history and therefore simultaneously represents one of the greatest opportunities and greatest challenges our civilization has ever faced. 
For the purposes of illustration, consider a humanoid robot with a total lifetime cost of $200,000 that works 20,000 hours before decommissioning. Its labor cost would be $10 per hour. Humanoid robots will enter the market at a cost capability of under $10 an hour for their label, labor on a trajectory to under a dollar an hour before 2035 and under 10 cents an hour before 2045. At the same time that cost is falling, capability will also be growing. At first, humanoid robots will only be able to perform relatively simple tasks. But with each day that passes, their capabilities will grow until by the 2040s, they will be able to do virtually anything a human can do and much more. Disruption from below. Initially, they will be cheaper per hour than hiring a human worker in many regions, but also less capable, slower, less competent, less adaptable. We have seen disruptions from below many times before, such as digital cameras. And uh, yeah, it's um, one of those things where it's not exactly, they're not equivalent, right? As we like to say on the show, uh, a horse is not equivalent to a car. My first car digital camera wasn't as good as a film camera, but it, <laughs> I sure took a lot of shots with those things. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, and I've still been taking some film photographs lately. It's a it's kind of a fun hobby, and there's been a resurgence in it, like there's a resurgence in vinyl. But you know, nothing can compete with a digital camera because the marginal cost of each photograph that you take is basically zero, and that's where we're heading with robot labor. The 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 marginal cost approaching zero or ten cents an hour. Um, you know, you buy a digital camera, you can basically take an infinite number of photos. I mean, at a certain point, it'll break down. But, you know, film photography these days is costing you a dollar a photo, maybe two dollars a photo, depending on what you're using. Uh, large format photos, ten dollars per photo is actually a thing now. Um, but, you know, this is this is what's going to happen. All right. Some other key points from the report. The disruption of labor is about tasks, not jobs. All products and services will get cheaper. All products will get better. Because the limits of skill and attention to detail that apply to humans do not apply to robots. Manufacturers will have far less incentive to cut corners, sacrifice precision, or fail to ensure the tasks and processes are performed with maximum care and thoughtfulness. thoughtfulness. Productivity will skyrocket. The disruption of labor accelerates the other foundational disruptions of energy, transportation, and food. Those are the things we cover on this show why I'm talking about it. Disruptions are already underway in energy, transportation, and food, each of which is a foundational sector of the global economy. According or adding the disruption of labor by humanoid robots to the mix will be like hosing gasoline on an already roaring inferno. By making all goods and services cheaper, higher quality, and generally expanding productivity at large, humanoid robots will only accelerate the deployment of each of the constituent technologies behind the other three foundational disruptions as well. In other words, robots will accelerate solar, wind, and uh, even auto manufacturing and battery manufacturing. And um, they'll advance uh, precision fermentation with food and agriculture and cellular agriculture, which is on the horizon. The disruptions already underway, particularly in energy and transportation, will also accelerate the development and an adoption of humanoid robots. So it's a circular thing, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, if the better they are, the more advanced they'll get and the faster that will happen. So working together, amplifying and accelerating each other, these four disruptions will open the door to an entirely new kind of production system based on a new economics of superabundance rather than scarcity. This is something Rethink X talks about again. This report worth a read. It's going to be linked in your show notes towards the top. I recommend everyone read it. And you know what struck me, Brian, is something I hadn't thought about. If Say I have a robot butler here. Let's just say that, you know, serves me sure. a drink before the show. Um, if we went to war with someone, you download software and then that thing becomes a soldier and goes off and fights a war. Comes back with a few bullet holes and sort <laughs> <laughs> I don't want war to happen, but it just, the, the repurposing of uh, humanoid robots seems far-fetched, but they do exist, and they are rapidly becoming something of a usable thing. It's going to start soft and get better afterwards. 
Yeah, I always like the example of George Jetson on the Jetsons TV show. His job was, he worked one hour a week and his job was to push a button. <laughs> and um, which, you know, is really just, they're just, uh, it's a make work project, I guess. Because yeah. obviously they could get a robot uh, in the Jetsons future to, to push that button. But, you know, this is perhaps where we're sit, uh, headed. Um, when we were kids, I remember there was a couple of kind of documentary type TV shows um, that talked about future innovations and new inventions and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, one was called Tomorrow Today. Yeah. Um, does that ring a bell? It rings a bell. And, you know, I always loved it as a kid because, you know, they were always showcasing these fantastic inventions. The problem was most of them, you know, never really came to pass. Like they would tend to cover things that were really kind of sexy and fun and interesting. But, you know, most of them, I think, didn't really go anywhere. And I always think about that when we talk about these kinds of future innovations on the show, because, you know, I don't want to talk about something that's just a fantasy that's never going to happen or going to happen, you know, way too far in the future. I, you know, I want to be somewhat kind of realistic and in, in, in the moment about all this stuff. But these damn humanoid robots are way closer, I think, than most people realize. I They could be closer than AI in general. Um, but, you know, AI is going to start doing tasks for us. We're still going to be needed, but there, you know, one person might be able to do three jobs with AI, even you know now or in a few short years, depending on what it is. But yeah, um, I also think that we could be ten years away from uh, from flying cars and robots, Brian. I mean, from seeing them somewhere in our lives, like the the flying cars are getting licensed in uh, not for personal use, but for you know, like basically large autonomous drones that fly people around. Uh, I don't, not excited about that particularly, but who knows how that will play out. Um, maybe it'll be safe. Maybe it'll just go over freeways. Maybe they won't be flying over my house, constantly dropping packages off. I don't know, but yeah. yeah and we started this show in 2020 with the idea of going till 2030 because we thought, well, this is going to be a pretty interesting 10 years. This is going to be a pretty interesting decade as far as these innovations go. Now, it's not sure how many of these will come to pass before 2030, but six more years, you know, at the pace this stuff is going. At the pace going, we're going. I mean. It's crazy. The fact that, now here's the thing. People say autonomous cars, not going to happen. Well, they exist. They exist in San Francisco. They're expanding in San Francisco now. Uh, they're yeah. not great. They're not perfect, but they're not killing people either. They sometimes cause traffic jams and and go too cautiously and things like that. But um, the, the robots are in Chinese factories now doing things. You can't say they're not going to happen. Uh, why yeah. humanoid robots? I'm not sure because it's to replace humanoid tasks, repetitive. They're, they're going to start by doing jobs that nobody wants to do. There's going to be certain agricultural jobs. Um, yeah, this podcast. <laughs> yeah. So in twenty thirty, we'll be replaced by by uh, robots. It'll keep going, but they'll just talk about right. the robots. Well, in my house, I'm going to get the robot to fix me drinks and do the laundry. That's the one thing I'm. I really oh, uh, dishes. Oh, I would like the dishes. dishes. Oh, be amazing. Yeah, but um, but yeah. Oh, the you know they have form. a human. They have a robot that's not humanoid that does dishes now in the kitchen and can even oh, prepare yeah. food. Like you know, get. You know, a cup of flour, do a recipe, and sort of push everything out for you. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they don't look anything like humans, but yeah, I just can't afford one yet. But yeah, the idea, I think, is that the humanoid form factor will be the most versatile because, well, this is what the world is built around. It's built around humans interacting with things. So if you want somebody to interact with the most things, make it in a humanoid form. Because, yeah, autonomous cars, those are already robots. Of course, there's robots in car factories that do welding and stamping and moving pieces and everything, specialized robots. But, you know, pretty soon humanoid robots to, you know, do the extra little tasks uh, around the factory. I'm looking forward to them working at McDonald's because they never get my order right. You know, yeah. the, the fast food labor, <laughs> there was a story in MSNBC about the labor costs going up for fast food. So fast food's gone up a lot since the pandemic because people generally don't want to work in fast food. And I don't blame them, but robots will. And they'll get my order right. Finally. So yeah, I, I should. It's, By uh, then, I won't be eating any fast foods at all. But <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> no, it was the odd it's salad. True. It will be. Uh, it will be a lot more accurate uh, in a robot future. 
Uh, okay, from Electric, U.S. wind generation fell in 2023 for the first time since the 1990s. So wind has been on a great trajectory of growing in the U.S., and there was 6.2 gigawatts added in 2023. And so you would think that the power produced would also increase, but no, it went down slightly less, only 2% less than the previous year. But uh, yeah, we were joking at the top of the show, but really it's uh, the wind just decreased in the year. It was an El Nino year. And it's that a weird year. The wind. Weird year. Yeah. Very weird. And of course, we're going to continue to have weird years, but the El Nino still has an effect. And then of course, 2022, the previous year, happened to have slightly more wind than normal. So, you know, that's the only reason it, it slightly decreased. But um, you like to talk about the capacity factor of different types of uh, power generation. And, and this is, there's always a theoretical maximum of 100% that something can produce. But of course, wind, the wind doesn't blow all the time. It blows at different speeds. So, um, yes, it, the, the capacity factor for wind in the U.S., it fell to an eight-year low of 33.5% because it just wasn't blowing enough. And the all-time high, 35.9% the year before in 2022. So um, you're never going to get that theoretical maximum of 100%, but, you know, 35.9% is not bad um, in the in the best year. So, you know, wind power continues to grow, and this is not going to be a major issue or anything, but... Uh, you know, I just thought it was interesting. There was some stumbling on offshore wind in the United States. Um, they pulled out of their contracts because the prices got too high. There was a shortage of ships capable of deploying that, but they're, they've rebounded. It's been delayed, but it's rebounded, and now those that are coming back. So, yeah, wind is one of those things where we need to get more of because solar is spreading like a... A bat virus. It is spreading very quickly, and we need um, to balance the renewable energy with more wind, which yeah. blows at different times and and yeah. more consistently. So the the best thing is to have a mix of wind and solar. Well, let's follow up on the shocking news we talked about last week that has divided the internet and probably the the host of this show. Which is fine, because I created a, I cloned your voice, and I have a, uh, a, a, a Brian to agree with me. <laughs> My name is Brian Stockton, and I am an Elon Musk sycophant. You're absolutely right, James. Yeah, so I can have a good conversation now with you that I find more satisfying when I talk about how Elon's crazy. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, some people are, are very shocked, and some people are reverse engineering what happened and trying to find an excuse for it, like uh, Sandy Monroe uh, and other people. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. Brian, I'm a good judge of character. One of my many talents, and I have a lot of them, is judging character. But like I say, I'm usually better doing it when I'm drunk, but I'm a good judge of character. And I've, uh, I judged Elon a long time ago when he um, started hitting on a female uh, interviewer during, uh, at the factory. And I thought, ah, oh, this guy's unhinged. And I, I sort of put it together with all the traits that I know in the world of people and what they'll end up acting like, and he's done that. We've argued on this show that his craziness will or will not affect the future of the transition and Tesla itself. I think I'm right, and I'm on the side of he's affecting the transition. And of course, I found some other people who agree. But in New York, there's a ride sharing there with Model 3s, and they're desperately in need of superchargers, which we're about to get built. And guess what? They're, they're not doing them anymore because there's the, the entire, let's remind people what happened. I, I know what happened. He, um, he was doing layoffs at Tesla because they've stopped selling cars, maybe partially because of him being a, a bad person. I've, I've encountered more and more people who will not drive around a Tesla. So anyway... Uh, he fired um, the head of the supercharging thing uh, and her entire 500-member team to spite her because she didn't do what he said. And that is unhinged. It is not a good idea. It is not how people get rid of departments. Uh, you don't leave utilities and uh, partners out in the uh, cold not knowing what's going on. That's what he did. And I think it was my own analysis of his psyche is that it probably made it worse because she was a woman because he's very toxic 
on Twitter, uh, male toxic toxicity it comes out of him, oozes out of him. This is what um, Tom at the uh, Batteries Included uh, podcast had to say. The timing is so nuts that it's almost as if Elon just wanted to throw a hand grenade into the industry. Sure, come on and sign all these agreements. And as soon as everybody just begins to join, just boom, you know, and, and like, you know, that, that's why I, I said earlier, if, if Tesla wanted to do this, if this was their plan to be a, to ma a manufacturer or to just get the supercharger network to a certain location and then say, okay, we've done it. This is how you do it, guys. Now it's on you to invest and do this. Okay, I, can, I, I wouldn't agree with it, but I can understand it. But the way this was done with just 500 jobs gone and all of these partners so like just left hanging, not knowing who to contact... That that's what made makes you lead you to believe this wasn't planned. Like this wasn't this is what we're gonna do. This was Elon, you know, just you know having a hissy fit and just firing everybody without thinking the the full consequences through. That's uh, Tom Maloney, a state of charge. He's got a YouTube channel. He also does it with uh, Kyle Connor with uh, Out of Spec Reviews. Got a large organization going there. They both do extensive coverage of supercharging and charging. And they have connections to the companies that are doing it. They have a very intimate uh, knowledge of the technology of what works and doesn't work and down to the, uh, you know, the smallest part of those superchargers. And this is Fred from Electric. He is the um, editor-in-chief at Electric. This is what he said on the Electric podcast this week. What Elon did this week, I think it's anti-mission, this firing of the supercharging team. I cannot reconcile it with the mission. So it is, it is absolutely uh, surprising in the worst way possible. This firing is going to result, I think, undeniably in a, at least significant slowdown in fast charging deployment in North America, probably major slowdown if uh, worst case scenario, and that's going to result in fewer EV cells globally, because as Elon himself said, the biggest driver of Tesla cells, EV cells is supercharger deployment, service center deployment. Those are the biggest drivers. If people have a service center near them, store near them, and they have supercharging station in between where they need to go and where they live, that's what makes their, their buying decision easier. And now we're gonna have less of that. And we're gonna have more supercharger wait time, more issues, it's just, it seems like an unhinged move and in a long series of instigation that led that way. So it seems like an unhinged move to me too. He wrote in an email that if you do not do what you're told, what I tell you to do, this is what's going to happen to you. I'm going to fire you and everyone you love and everyone who has been working hard. 500 people, Brian. It's just, it makes no sense. Uh, it doesn't seem like... It makes sense. Yahoo Finance writes, plenty of investors are blaming Musk for the company's wandering vision, saying he's alienated buyers and tanked the car maker's reputation with his bizarre political outbursts and fixation on autonomous driving, all at the expense of basic services for Tesla drivers, like a reliable charging network. Brian, I was on the cusp as a Chevy Bolt GM guy with a car of getting my connector and access to the supercharger network. Well, that's gone. At least for now, maybe we if we were because these are the people who were working on that being compatible. They're gone, and they're not being replaced immediately. And I was so close, I was so close to being able to go on a trip this summer. And and if my charger network wasn't working, I could have went 100 feet to the right and used a Tesla because they're often together here, and um, it would have been security for me. I'm disappointed. I'm I'm dis I kept it, you know, because they've opened up these charging networks too all the other companies and the other companies ostensibly are going to need superchargers and the superchargers are going to, some of them are going to fill up. Some of them are going to become congested. We're going to need more of them. And they are the only people who are doing it right. That's the one thing that Tesla had going for that you could not argue with. They just throw it out the window. And I'm, I'm unhappy about that. Now, Ioni, Ioni, I think it's the, the, you know, there was this conglomeration of different EV makers like Hyundai and uh, GM, they're starting this big charging network. There's seven auto manufacturers, and they're going to have chargers by the end of this year. But 
the people who are running that are the people who are running the other third party chargers, which were crap. So I don't have much faith. We need a big charging network to come and expand and be reliable and make sense and, you know, have the understanding. But they've they've had 15 years of experience doing this and finding out where the right places are to put these superchargers and um, and how to do them quickly. They've figured out manufacturing of them. You know, they, they prefab them in a factory on a concrete slab and take those out to the work site. It does take time to set up a charger. There's a lot of utility interconnection that has to go on and can take a couple of years. I'm worried that this is just one more thing and the oil companies are just having a good laugh that it's another, you know, iron rod in the spokes of progress. Well, I don't have any particular insight. I don't have any special knowledge on this, so I don't really have an opinion on it. Wait, it you does do, seem you like do it's Brian, a, you do. Elon Musk has gone insane and it will delay the transition <laughs> to electric vehicles. James, Thank you. you're so smart. Thank you. Well, that's very kind of you. Uh, it does seem like a bad idea, but I, it remains to be seen what actually eventually happens. All right, let's step into the mailbag. Um, yeah, we got a letter from Phil in the United States. How... He wants us to look at how big oil helped push the idea of carbon footprints. We've talked about that on the show before. Your carbon footprint helps you identify actions you can take pers and to personally fight climate change. It also shifts responsibility away from petrochemical companies. And yeah, he has a podcast to listen to. And uh, I don't know that what's the name of it. I've lost the name, but I'll link it in the show notes. Is it On Point? Yes, I think it's On Point. You're right. Yeah. Sorry. So we love to hear from our listeners, like Phil. Thanks for writing. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it all the time. So contact us at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. And you can also, this is our favorite, leave us a voicemail message so we can hear your voice at speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow. And not only us, but everyone, all our listeners can listen to other listeners have thoughts. And I like that. Uh, all right, so onto a story now from the Green Energy Futures podcast. I came across this the other day. I thought it was super fascinating because this Green is... Green Energy Futures is this cool little YouTube show website that's and been podcast, going... podcast, yep. It's been going on before anyone else hardly was doing it. I just... It's one of my earliest um, sort of entries into this uh, in, a, in a big way was that, but it's still a fairly small undertaking. Um, David Dodge runs it, right? Yeah, but uh, they had this cool little story about um, a thing I had never heard of before, which was interesting because it's been going since 2012. And I just thought it was a really great illustration of the idea of a smart grid and how a smart grid works and how we can transition off of uh, dirty energy to clean energy and get some benefits in uh, the, the process. And, you know, it's it's kind of like, maybe like a smaller version of what's going on in California, because this is going on in California as well. There's virtual power plants of people's batteries in homes and whatnot. Uh, but this is a very small scale thing. It's Summerside PEI. It's only a town of 15,000. And they only have 588 of these electric furnaces installed, but they're there to capture energy when there's excess clean power uh, on the grid. So go ahead and play the clip. And although wind is an amazing resource in PEI. And at times we had too much wind. We had to actually spill it into maritime electric grid. And so that started us on how do we use that energy locally? So we started a program. So the Heat for Less Now was our consumer program on a smart grid system back in 2000. We started developing that in 2010. Summerside offered incentives to residents to switch out their dirty oil furnaces with electric furnaces that have the unique ability to use excess wind power and store it as thermal energy using smart meters. So we would replace it with a full electric furnace and a full electric hot water heater, which was smart controlled. We can inject energy into it 12 hours of any day, and we pick the hours when the electricity goes in it. And the other 12 hours, it doesn't draw any electricity, zero, and just depletes the storage or thermal storage energy of the furnaces to go back into the home. 
uh, operating over 12 years, we have not had complaints on loss of service for heat or hot water. So I love this. This has going, been going on for such a long time. This is, you know, totally proven out. These furnaces are basically simple electric furnaces, but they appear to have, you know, basically bricks inside. We've talked about, yeah. you know, brick type storage for thermal energy and up to 12 hours a day, they can heat these bricks and that's all stored as uh, energy inside this furnace. And then the homeowner uses it when they want, uh, you know, same thing with the, the water heaters. Um, you know, they're looking at adding heat pumps to this as well, because there are heat pumps that can do energy storage as well. Um, and, you know, just it's it's inefficient, this type of, you know, old, you know, standard electric type of furnace. But, you know, it could actually work out better um, because they can take in the energy for 12 hours a day and store it. The heat pumps only like four hours a day. They can feed energy into it. But that's enough to you know, have, you know, shave off the peak so that people that have the, the heat pumps in the future, they won't ever have to turn the power on for them during the, the peak electricity times. So yeah, I just thought this was great. It's a small town, only 15,000 people, but they basically started their own utility to get themselves off fossil fuels. They, you know, they're uh, up to 46% uh, clean energy, which is a, a huge improvement over basically nothing, which is what they had before. I've actually been to Summerside PI when I was 12. It, I remember it being a very shiny, happy, very pleasant place. One of the nicer places I've ever been to. Uh, yeah. Look at them. I didn't actually think that they would do something like this. Bricks and furnaces fascinate me, though, because, you know, these uh, these bricks, they're not normal bricks, but they're made for uh, retaining heat. They seem to be doing an interestingly good job. And something I should be doing in my passive solar house here is storing heat from thermal energy from the, the sun and dissipating it slowly over the night. That's something I wish I could do more, especially in the winter. Yeah, well, some passive solar houses have a thing that's basically called like a heat wall or something where it's, it's you can put an extra, yeah, lots, what's it called? Well, people use masonry and stone as much as they can. Yeah. Sometimes there's a yeah. concrete floor. Sometimes it's in a wall. You can even buy, this is something that fascinated me and I don't know how often it happens. You can water, buy water tanks that fit into the cavity of your wall between the two by fours. They're just that thick. You fill them with water because water is the best, uh, one of the best ways to store, you know, take it in and give it off. Uh, it does it very easily. So, yeah. And then sometimes people put scrap um, gypsum board or gyp rock or uh, drywall in between that because that holds some too. And I thought about that because you can go to a scrap yard or somewhere and, you know, outside a construction site and just get chunks of it and maybe do that. So, yeah, there's different ways yeah. to do that, but I would like to do that more. Yeah, thermal mass. The, the one I'm thinking of, it's kind of like the monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey. You know, there's people that have a wall like that in their houses that's sort of like a feature wall, but it's where it can catch the sun and it's right. made out of slate. It's, or it's stone. better if the sun can actually shine on it, which is, yeah. you know, great. And, and then when heat up during the day and it just slowly releases that heat at night. Brian, uh, you may argue with people, common people, the common people who don't listen to our podcast about battery recycling. There's myths out there. And I see this written with confidence every day. Uh, electric car batteries go to the landfill after four or five years, which is a joke because my 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 electric car, uh, my oldest one's 11 and a half years old almost already. And uh, they basically last the life of the car. They're supposed to. They're designed for that. And the life of the car is the same as any other car. Um, the fact is, and I'm going to get to this in, a, in my next segment after this, is battery recycling is going very well. Um, J.B. Straub, who is a board member, the only sane board member of uh, Tesla, uh, he was one of the co-founders of Tesla. He broke off and started a battery recycling firm called Redwood Materials, and they are showing 95% of materials can be recycled. They've just started up their factory. They're going to need many more. The United States, everywhere is going to need a lot more. This is just the beginning. There's not a lot out there already to have to do this. 95% of those uh, materials, but get this. Batteries, they might last 10 years in a grid if you have them for a power grid, big batteries, and you're using them so, you know frequently. They might last 20 years in an electric car. But uh, when you recycle them, all this time has passed, and the batteries are better. 
We've talked about 25% improvement of a battery that was amazingly announced just last summer and is already 25% more energy. So you take the minerals out of this battery, you put it into a new battery that gives you 10, 15, 200 percent, I don't know, a lot more energy based on time and progress. And therefore, it's greater than 100 percent recyclable. So we talk about batteries, uh, minerals and batteries today being in uh, still in use 130 years from now. They're infinite. They can be infinitely used. And for the first while, we'll have to mine a little bit to add those minerals to them, probably. But basically, you're going to have more energy the batteries that they go into and it's going to be greater than 100 percent and that's you know it's, it's the thing that gives most people pause is the mining for batteries but at some point uh china one study showed uh 2063 they won't need any more battery any mining at all it's just completely it'll be a circular economy for batteries it'll be completely recycled and reused so the idea is that these batteries get deconstructed and then, yeah, so much time has passed, the new batteries that they're put into have infinitely greater capacity. And that's where you get the greater than 100% figure. Yeah. So I'm very enthusiastic about that. And uh, also just the progress of batteries. It's hard to explain that the people, they just assume batteries don't last any better than they do in their laptop. And that's just not the way it is. And there's lots of reasons why. Yes, uh, people often make those assumptions. Well, on to another recycling story. This is from Bloomberg, and it's about Patagonia, the eco-friendly clothing company, and they're working on endlessly recycling wetsuits, a completely different thing from batteries, but the idea is the same, uh, that they're going to deconstruct these wetsuits at the molecular level and then uh, you know, rebuild them as basically new fabric. And this also fits into what you were just talking about. And it also fits into that kind of Star Trek future that, um, you know, I was fascinated with as a kid, because this is, this is basically Star Trek technology. This is how they apparently like the uniforms in Star Trek, they don't wash them, they deconstruct them at the molecular level and I, reconstruct I did them. not know that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not, it's one of those things that's like a, a nerd fact that's not always necessarily featured on the show, I don't think. But they have these replicators on Star Trek. That's where their food comes from, a replicator. Well, they, they use a replicator for their uniforms too, and it's it's deconstructed at the molecular level. And that's why I thought this, uh, this story was interesting. Patagonia already offers uh, lifetime repairs for wetsuits, so you can take your wetsuit in and, and get it fixed up. But they decided to kind of go further. And the idea being that, uh, you know, they can theoretically, this is not proven yet that it's 100% recyclable. But this is the idea that it, it um, they can be melted down. There's a thing called carbon black. That's one of the, like the main constructive elements of these suits. It's basically like rubber, like, like the material used for tire and whatnot. But um, yeah, this can be theoretically uh, melted down. So they're doing it now on a small scale. It has yet to be kind of proven out on a long scale, a long term uh, kind of scale. But um, yeah, I always like these uh, futuristic kind of stories. Can Batwoman recycle her costume as well? Is that in there? <laughs> yes, that that's absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, keeping with the theme of recycling, uh, let's go to um, Redwood Materials. This is something that Bloomberg published uh, a big story on some time ago now. I think it's uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, but I thought we better talk about it because it's important and um, I think people are interested in it. The Stanford report, they've done a Stanford report on Redwood Recycling. Uh, it's still under peer review, but found that Redwood's recycling and refining operations cut carbon dioxide emissions by 70% compared with traditional recycling methods. So they've got very, they're not just recycling, they're doing it, you know, with lower carbon emissions, significantly lower than uh, other people who are doing it. They're coming up a way to do it right. Um, yeah, so 70% compared with traditional recycling methods and 40% lower than other recycling processes. Um, more than 95% of the key minerals can be profitably recycled more than 95%. So nothing goes to a landfill at, these, at this facility and no water leaves the facility except uh, the sanitary waste from sinks and toilets. 
there's no gas lines, Brian. Everything is electric. So if everything is electric, you can power it with clean, renewable electricity if you want. And that is what they are aiming to do. So a quote here from uh, Colin Campbell, their chief technology officer, says, Once we've changed over the entire vehicle fleet to electric and all those materials or all those minerals are in consumption, we'll only have to replace a couple percent each year that's lost in the process. There are three basic approaches to recycling batteries, each with its own drawbacks. You can burn them, which is wasteful and can result in toxic emissions. You can dissolve them in strong chemicals, which is expensive and uses the most energy, or separate them mechanically, which can be labor intensive and dangerous. Until the last few years, most US recyclers simply ground up the batteries and sent them overseas for someone else to deal with. But Redwood, materials is borrowing uh, what it sees as the most useful bits from each of those categories of recycling. The company's process starts at an indoor staging area where everything from discarded earbuds that have batteries in them, Bluetooth headphones, laptop batteries, EV modules from recycled Chevy bolts uh, are dumped because there was a big Chevy bolt recall. The battery has a defect in them from LG. And uh, they're dumped into a conveyor belt and the jumbled mess is carried roughly 30 feet up to a hole in the wall where it exits the building into a giant churning metal tunnel dubbed RCI, uh, suspended high above the ground. Uh, RCI is essentially an enormous slow cooker, baking the junk at several hundred degrees for about an hour and is perhaps Redwood's biggest innovation thus far. Traditional recycling through burning uses heat well over a thousand degrees Celsius or 1800 Fahrenheit to separate out precious metals. But Redwood's goal at this stage is to preserve and prepare the materials for the next steps in the most efficient way. So they're only doing it at a lot less temperature. Uh, there's no combustion involved here. Like I said, it's electric uh, heating and no emissions, no combustion, no emissions, which is actually surprising to me. I, I thought there would be a more of a, a, you know, a hurtful carbon process, but it's actually a lot better than I ever hoped for. It simply reduces the glues, plastics, and unwanted fluids into charcoal. The high grade black carbon, Weren't we just talking about that? Leftover can be sold for use in black paints and industrial lubrication, possibly wetsuits. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, so it uses surprisingly little electricity. Once the kiln heats up, the energy released from the batteries is self-sustaining because it starts to have a chemical process and give off the energy that it had stored. Think of it as a controlled slow motion version of a battery fire running nonstop day and night Week after week, it safely releases the charge in any batteries that could pose a danger to workers while breaking down the stuff that binds key minerals together. That's ingenious, if you ask me. It's using their own, their own heat that's already there, the battery's potential. Um, after leaving the RC, is it RC1 or R, it's the RC1? Okay, I said RCI. The charboil batteries pass through machines that sift the material through screens. Powerful magnets are used to isolate certain materials. The remaining mineral-rich dust, known as black mass, is mixed into a slurry of solvents and fed into another building that resembles a large beer brewery with towering stainless steel tanks that uses chemical chemicals, pressures, and uh, filters to and evaporation to separate the products into their core elements. So you got your lithium, you got your copper, you've got uh, some cobalt in the older batteries, and all these things are getting separated. And uh, copper foil production has never existed in the United States. For the last year, Redwood has been cranking out sample rolls of copper foils for batteries to, for them to test. In the coming weeks, the company's foils will officially enter the supply chain used in American EVs. Fantastic. So now when you buy an EV, you're going to have some of it that's already recycled. Uh, they struggled, the uh, CEO of the company chalks up the accelerated timetable to unanticipated EV recalls, like the Bolt, and higher than anticipated levels of scrap materials from new battery factories. Apparently, battery factories, like cookie factories, have some mistakes, because I went and ate some of the mistakes at the Peak Freens factory in Toronto, which you sent me to. So yeah, I've yeah, got 10 pounds of the... fat here that's all on you, Brian. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they make mistakes and that stuff, you know, is not good enough and has to be recycled. But it's great that it can be. 
No, and I've often wondered about things like earbuds, like the ones that I'm wearing right now that have tiny little batteries in them, but I guess yeah. it's possible. Yeah, I wonder about that too. So it's exciting stuff, and I'm really glad to see it happening. It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy, and transportation. The average cost of renewable energy plunged below the average cost of fossil fuels in Asia-Pacific region last year. The gap will continue to widen, says clean energy research firm Wood McKenzie. Toyota's all-electric BZ4X had its strongest sales year ever. That's not saying much, but it even, to my surprise, outsold the Prius Prime Plug-in electric vehicle, hybrid electric Interesting. vehicle. Uh, under today's policy settings, the by the way, my son, he's got this big wad of money because he lives with his uncle. He's got student loans, so it just goes in sure. a big pot of money. And then he has a summer job, doesn't have any um, huge expenses, uh, is driving this whole car. He's thinking of buying a new car. So I went to look at, you know, what, should he buy a new car? Because he probably could, you know. Um, or should he, because you know, what you get for 20,000 ain't much these days. It's remarkably, remarkably, you know, bad. Uh, you want a, a Corolla or a, you know, a Civic, you got to have one with 200,000 kilometers on it or a uh, hundred and thirty thousand miles or something. So there's a lot of bad things, but anyway, Toyota, every car you look at says limited inventory. They still can't get their inventory back. And and also they've gone up in price. Like everything has gone way up in price. And that's dumb because electric cars are coming down in price. But you, what you don't talk about is how the other cars are really going up in price because they really are. Yeah, I think they must have decided it was somehow advantageous for them to have less stock, to have less things around, sell them at higher prices. Maybe it's not so bad for them. Oh, they had a good year, Toyota. Under today's policy settings, the uptake of EVs, including cars, vans, trucks, buses, and two- and three-wheelers, is set to avoid the need for over 10 million barrels a day of oil by 2035. That is from the IEA. Uh, the U.S. experienced twice as many weather-related power outages from 2014 to 2023 as in the previous decade. Twice as many. So you think that climate change isn't affecting things now? Talk about insurance. Talk about uh, power uh, grids that are getting affected. And it's time for a CS Fast Fact. 7.2 megawatt wind turbines will generate 34 times as much energy as it takes to manufacture and install them. And these turbines have a recyclability rate of 86.6%. Didn't know that. Didn't know that. A CCS installation at Boundary Dam 3 coal plant, that is the carbon capture, trying to make the emissions into little chunks of stuff and pump it into the ground to get more oil out, which is absurd. Uh, it's supposed to do 90% of the emissions. And after nine years, it was at 57% overall. Never on one full day has it done uh, 90%. That is from the IEEFA Institute. Boundary Dam was the eighth largest single source of uh, GHG emissions in 2019 in the whole country. The number eight source, and that's with carbon capture on it. That's with carbon capture wow. on it. That's filthy, disgusting. You know, we talked about how, you know, coal as uh, way dirtier than anything else. It doesn't, if you have a small amount of coal, it still somehow equals all your other stuff that's burning. Indonesia currently produces half the world's nickel. Under a strongman president, it is set to mine even more, according to Yale Environment. For the first time in eight years, Canada imported more electricity from the United States than it exported. That's kind of shocking. And why? Uh, not only did the wind not blow, <laughs> for wind power, the rain did not drop because there was a, a large uh, dry conditions and a prolonged drought that reduced hydroelectric power generation. That's from the energy mix. China's Xpeng Motors is promising a 800 kilowatt charging car by the fall of this year. That is the speed at which it charges on a fast charger. Uh, your car, what do you peak at? 260? Yeah, two two fifty six. Two fifty six. So that's fast. You know how fast that is? That's one kilometer of range per second. 
And they're they're making these. They're they're not saying this isn't a concept car that we're going to do ten years from now or maybe never. They're actually making them uh, this year. I think the third quarter. And they're deploying their own supercharging stations in China that can charge those cars because that's going to take a special supercharging station to do 800 watts. That's like, you know, what semi-trucks would need. Uh, Electrify America estimates that 380 plus gigawatt hours of electricity it delivered last year. This is a charging network in the States for uh, cars run by uh, Volkswagen because their emission scandal, they decided to make a charging network in the United States and Canada. Uh, they avoided the consumption of more than 52 million gallons of gasoline just from that charging network. And by the way, that's amazing considering they never work. <laughs> so yeah, the fact that they just place that much. Uh, Walmart has an electric semi-truck spotted in Stockton, California. I thought you'd like that. Wow. One of your favorite Love California it. towns. Waymo will begin testing fully autonomous rides without a human driver for our employees on San Francisco Peninsula city streets north of San Mateo. This is uh, an expansion uh, south of San Francisco. And when they do this, they uh, do not have a human driver in them, but they only do it for their employees at first so that um, they can figure things out before the general public hops on that particular um, place. Hyundai. Hyundai continues to see strong growth for the Ionic 5 and 6. These two vehicles were up 54% year on year in sales. That's from Inside EVs. Ford's April EV sales were also up by a whopping 129% year on year. And, you know, they were yeah. doing so bad, we almost wrote them off. But, you know, now that they've lowered their prices... No, and there's a lot of stories out there with headlines like, oh, people aren't buying EVs anymore. Oh, the EV market is crashing. And there are and a lot. I mean, don't undersell yeah. it. There's a ton of them. And it would appear that there is a slight decrease in the pace, but uh, everything is still on track with people adopting especially EVs. Especially if you price them right, especially if they charge well like the Hyundai's. Uh, Bloomberg NEF, this, uh, the global energy storage market almost tripled in 2023 that that's ungodly that's uh, three times in one year is huge uh, the largest year-on-year -year gain on record in 2024 the market is set to add another 100 gigawatt hours of capacity for the first time largely driven by china and finally this week this is a cool find from 1912 brian breaking news this is uh we finally got to it it's been on the back burner uh, U.S. Census uh, describing how replacing horses with electric vehicles would not overload the electricity grid because the EVs could charge at night. They had this concern 110, 112 years ago. It's incredible. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know, but some of the first cars were electric. And, uh, you know, they were actually in use and bought by people. There's, you know, Jay Leno still has one that he drives around. Um, but you know, they didn't have the range of course, but they were, they were a thing. They didn't have lithium ion batteries, which only came into usability around the time when, uh, Musk was, uh, making his first Teslas. Um, it is only natural therefore that this is the article that throughout the country, an effort has been made to develop this new class of business and build up the vehicle load. The opportunity thus offers the opportunity thus offered is enormous. At the meeting of Illinois Electrical Association of 1912, it was stated by Mr. George Jones that if half the horses in Chicago were replaced by electric vehicles, the central station load created would amount to 94 million kilowatt hours per annum. As such, vehicles are usually charged late at night when the ordinary demand for current is small. No additional investment in central station apparatus would be necessary. And this off-peak business would improve the general load factor by about 13%. It's exactly, exactly what we're talking about currently. Amazing. From 1912, and it's it's nearly identical to what we're talking about now. All right. Well, that's our show for this week. Please take the time to contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. And around social media, we are Clean Energy Pod. You can find videos of our show on TikTok and YouTube. And that includes special content 
not featured sometimes on the podcast. And as a test, we are putting our full video podcast on TikTok, at least for the near term. The Clean Energy Store is there, linked in your show notes. Hats, shirts, mugs, get them all, get them now. Uh, show off your Clean Energy Show pride. You know, rate and review us if you can on Apple or wherever you're listening to our show, whatever app you're getting. I'm very sad that the uh, Google Podcast app is going away because Google is Google. Now you have to... I was, it was worked for me, Brian. It worked so well on my Android phone, and now it's gone. I don't have a Too good bad. alternative. Uh, all my subscriptions, everything's gone in June. You can donate to the show to help us keep podcasting. That link is in your show notes as well. You can use PayPal to make a monthly or one-time little donation. If you're new to the show, welcome. Uh, subscribe in your podcast app. We do it every week. We'll be doing it again next week. So make sure you get that episode coming in. Thanks for listening. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>